Thank you. 
Peace. 
really bless us with all this, this life that you give us. We worship Him in your hand. Emmanuel, we thank you, Lord, for every action of your life. portion of this audience. <laughs> and that's actually what I wanted to talk about today. I am Indian by passport, hence the brown, but I grew up in Malaysia for most of my life, but I've also lived in the Middle East, I've lived in the Netherlands, and I've also lived in Switzerland, and been moving since the age of 12, about every three years or so. So that's led to a lot of different questions and conversations on identity and belonging, and that's the God story that I want to talk about today. So I think one of the things that comes with growing up in a place or being in a place and knowing it is knowing I belong here. If I say I'm going home, I'm going home to where I know what's happening, where I understand the people, where I understand the culture. And I didn't have that. I think if anybody asked me, and if you ask me right now, where's home? I would say, oh, it's in the Hague, because I moved there five months ago. <laughs> and that's about as close to home as I get. And this has led to a lot of confusion and conversations, and many of you might experience that or relate to that yourself. Who am I? Am I really Indian? Am I Malaysian? But I'm not Dutch, and I'm definitely not Swiss. Um, and that was a massive struggle because then you enter a room full of people, a room full of international people like this, and you're like, okay, but where do I belong here? Do I go find the Asians? Do I maybe go find the engineers? I'm an engineer. Do I maybe go find the people of my age? You know, is there a bracket by which I can create a group around myself, a community? Is there a way that when I look in the mirror, I can say, yeah, this is who I am. I am this and this and this and this. And without that, you start experimenting a lot. And I tried that. I moved here for the first time at the tender age of 17. 
and had so many questions. I was like, maybe I am just, you know, this like stereotypical engineer trying to the student engineering organization. Maybe I belong with, you know, all of the Asians, let's cook together, you know, but that didn't really feel right. And I always felt like I wasn't really present and I missed out. And when people were talking about, oh, I'm going home, I'm like, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> and in the moments of the pandemic that have swept the world, I think that was the hardest point. Because where was home in that moment? Where could I go? My family lived in Malaysia, but I don't feel any connection to Malaysia anymore. The food's amazing, but I don't have friends there. I have friends here in the Netherlands, but I was living in Switzerland at the time of the pandemic. I don't have friends there either. And it's just this begging of God, of like, God, who am I? What do I do with this? Where do I go? What group of people do I belong to? Who can I count on? And I think in the middle of that confusion and those, yeah, just those moments where I was almost running, trying to find somewhere to belong to, God really brought light and illumination. And he did it in two ways. I have notes because otherwise I go on sidetracks. So <laughs> I think the first one was through scripture. I was studying Galatians and I'm gonna read to you a portion of Galatians. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I think that was the first time that it really hit me. Galatians, this book to a Gentile church written by a Jewish man who spent a good amount of time persecuting the very people he had become. The Jewish people were people who belonged. They were the people of God. If you were circumcised, you were Jewish, you, you know, belonged to this group. And Paul is out here telling them that there's neither Jew nor Greek, but everybody is one in Christ Jesus. It blew my mind. Because it was this God that said, hey, for so long you had to belong to this people group to actually be with me, to be my people. But at that point, God is telling us, no. He says, you just have to believe in Jesus. And that's it. I didn't have to belong to a people group to be of Christ or to love Christ. And that really changed me because I also read Hebrews 11. It's Abraham and it's Moses and it's Isaac and it's Jacob and it's Noah and it's all of these people that were Jewish. They, they were the people from whom all of this came from. And yet the Bible says that they behaved as exiles and pilgrims in their land. Why? Because they were looking ahead. They died in faith, having never received the fullness of their promise, but because they were looking to a heavenly country, a place where they would belong forever and ever with God. And I think that was the first time I could look at myself in the mirror and just be like, so, so I don't belong here. And that is the best thing ever. Because I do have somewhere where I'm going. I'm going home. I'm going home. And I think that was, yeah, the moment where you also start to become so much more confident in yourself. You're not trying to fit in anymore because I knew that, yeah, my culture was the culture of heaven, just like it is for all of you. You know, that's where we're going. We look forward to that heavenly home. But that's a theoretical, and it's, it's a very interesting personal understanding. But I think what was really cool was also God giving me that place of belonging. I came here in August last year I think yeah it was August of last year and when I walked in these doors not most well most of you didn't know me of course and none of you had also known that I was coming from a place of really deep loneliness I had been part of the church that I was at in Switzerland for about a, two years at that point and there wasn't a place more lonely than that church for me I just I just wanted to belong I was in a new country no people where was I supposed to find my friends that understood me? And I walked into these church doors and all of you welcomed me like you knew me your whole life. All of you took me in, you loved me, you invited me to dinners. You said, hey, you know, like, let's go have a chat, let's get a coffee. I was here for like a week. <laughs> so, and I came just for my sister. But in that moment, God showed me what it felt like to belong again that in that period of loneliness that I think most of you have experienced, God gave me that taste of what it's going to be like forever and ever. 
he, his body accepted me as part of their own. I wasn't on the outside, I, I didn't even speak the language here, but that was that taste of what that home is going to be like. And that, for me, brought even further illumination and clarity into this question of my own identity. Because yes, I belong with Jesus, but so do all of you. And that means I belong with all of you. And this, this is home, right here, Sunday mornings and throughout the week, in my home groups and the people I pray with, that's home, that's where I belong, because that's where God's glorified. That's where he is. And that's what brings us all together, right? We all love Jesus. He saved all of us, and he's changed our lives. You know, it doesn't matter anymore if this bodily sign of circumcision. No, God has removed our fleshly body, and we are new creations, and these new creations are God's people. We all look the same because we all look like Jesus. My eyes might be different, my hair might be different, my skin color is hella different. I don't probably speak, don't speak your language, but you're family. You know, and in all my years of questioning and wondering, I've come to this realization again and again, slowly and shortly, but I think last August was really this place where I had been more lonely than I'd ever been before, and God had brought that illumination. I'm so thankful to him, you know, because now I know who I am. I know who I am, I know where I belong, which means I'm so much more comfortable in this world. I can go out and bring people into that belonging as well. I can bring them home. Because that's what we're all looking for, right? To love, to be loved, and in God, and with his body, there's the answer to all of that. And I couldn't be more grateful for the day I stepped into this church and the day that I met Jesus. And I just want to encourage all of you, you might just be saying hi to a stranger on a Sunday morning, but you don't know that you're becoming part of their testimony. You don't know that you're becoming an answer to prayer. Your love is also the way that Jesus works. He's done it in my life and he'll do it again through all of you. So yeah, be those citizens of heaven. Be those citizens of heaven. Live like you're there. Bring heaven, the kingdom of God, down to earth. And in doing so, you're gonna change lives and you're gonna change my state and you're gonna change the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jemima, and I'm going to be doing the announcements. Um, so today we're going to have, um, on Tuesdays, we're going to have um, Bible studies um, at the lender's house. And okay. Yeah, it's up there at 8 o'clock. Um, everyone's invited to join. All students are also welcome there, too. Um, and we're also having drum at, at Wednesdays at 7.30, and that's our university ministry for the students. Um, so for everyone who's new, please join us. We're excited to meet you and have fellowship with you as well. Um, and this Saturday, we're going to be, be having our prayer and outreach. So we're going to meet at 11 in the St. Petersburg um, on the mountain. Um, and we're going to just pray together for a short time before going out to evangelize and invite people um, into you know, our family, into our church. So I hope to see you guys there and uh, yeah, have a good time, good conversations with people. Um, and after the meeting today, we're, we have um, a picnic at the Refugee Center at 2. Um, so it'd be nice to see you guys there and also meet with new people, people who've been displaced, um, and share the love of God with them. And next week, Sunday, we're also going to have a potluck lunch at the church, so be ready for that um, to also meet with each other. Um, and in two weeks, on Sunday the 25th, we're not going to have an in-person church, so um, I think church will be online at service, and hopefully we can come together in small groups um, if you're with each other to have our church service um, together. And finally, um, if you want to give money towards the work of the church, um, you can do it online um, using that QR code or using the account number over there, and you can also give at the greeter's table if you want to. Oh, and last but not least, um, if you want to see all of these things um, in your email, because there was a lot of information, you can sign up for a church weekly newsletter um, using this link, and it's um, capital sensitive, so it's capital E-R-I-D and uh, lowercase e. going to do the Bible reading for today. The Bible reading is from Acts 26, verses 4 to 18. 
Acts 26, verses 4 to 18. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify if they're willing that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. If it was not clear, this is Paul speaking. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of, Lord, of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time, I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the Goans. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Good morning everyone, my name is Blaise, uh, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm so happy to see all of you here, uh, you look so nice uh, this Sunday. Um, <laughs> would you just take one minute or so to greet someone around you, just say hi to someone who's next to you, and if the person doesn't want to say hi, just smile, it's fine. <laughs> Last Sunday, Pastor Mark, by the way, Pastor Mark is not here with us this Sunday. He's preaching to another church. Um, um, so I'm asked to share with you God's word today. But last Sunday, Pastor Mark introduced our new teaching series called The Roadmap. Um, it is uh, a series in which we are going to kind of explain the roadmap of our church, explain um, where we are going as a church and what you can expect. Because uh, some of you are new to this church. It is nice for you to know where you put your faith uh, in, right? Uh, so, um, and this roadmap is based on the story of Saul of Tarsus that happened in Acts chapter 9, that you can also read in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26, like we read today. And we have resumed all those, um, this story, this roadmap, into four uh, steps. The first one is encounter with Jesus. This is what Pastor Mark spoke last Sunday, and I'm going to share about illumination today. And next week, we're going to talk about transformation and then destination. We're going to look at how Paul's encounter with Jesus brought illumination into his life. And today, I'm going to share briefly um, the levels of illumination that happens to our lives when we encounter Jesus. What are those areas that Jesus brings illumination to? And um, I'm going to go directly to uh, the Word of God. So... When the Apostle Paul encountered Jesus in his life, uh, he saw a, bright, a, a light that was brighter than the sun, and that light illuminated him, but also his companion. And that brought the illumination in his life. And the first illumination that took place is 
is the illumination of who God is. Illumination of who God is. The um, soul of Tarsus was persecuting Jesus. He was against Jesus. He was opposing Jesus because he didn't know who Jesus was. When Jesus appeared to him on Damascus Road, the first question he asked was, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? I want to know you. Because I am opposing you because I don't know you. Who are you, Lord? Reveal yourself to me. And whenever we, uh, we don't have the revelation of who Jesus is, we will not take him for who he really is. Sometimes we will oppose him because we don't know who that Jesus is. And, and Saul of Tarsus was, was opposing Jesus because he, has, he had no idea who Jesus was. And Jesus revealed himself to him. He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And you know, whenever Jesus starts his sentence by saying, I am, you know that it's going to be a great revelation of who he is. In the book of John, in the Gospel of John, you read lots of declarations of, of Jesus, the different I am's of Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And, and, and on another occasion, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Even when uh, God met with Moses, and Moses asked him, so you are sending me to the people, who should I say that he's sending me? He said, tell them that I am is sending you. So whenever Jesus starts by saying, I am, you know that he's going to share you uh, more about who he is. And illumination starts by knowing who Jesus really is. One day, Jesus asked his disciples, so who do people say that I am? I'm really curious, you know. And they say what? Well, some, some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Jeremiah. Some say you are Elijah. Some say you are just one of those prophets. And you know, sadly, even among, as, as Christians, we don't really take Jesus for who he is. We think Jesus is just one of those prophets. We think Jesus is the same like Prophet Muhammad, or he's the same like, you know, all the gods of this, of this world, until he really reveals himself to, to you, until you have that revelation, like Peter. Peter had the, the right answer. Peter said, no, Jesus, I know who you are. You are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. And Jesus said, you are happy, you are blessed. Because it's not blood and, 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 and flesh that revealed this to you. It's my heavenly God. Whenever we have illumination of who God is, whenever we have this encounter with Jesus, then we know who Jesus is. And when you know who Jesus is, you will never oppose him. You will never be against him. You will want to be more like Jesus. You will, you will want to share more about Jesus. You, if the first thing you will do when you wake up in the morning is talking with Jesus. Whenever you have that illumination of who he is, you want to share Jesus around you. So sometimes we are so used to who Jesus is. You know, in the book of, I love the book of Job because uh, Job had heard about God. Sometimes when we come to church, we hear about God. We read the stories. We know the stories of the Bible. We come to church every Sunday. We are used to hearing God. And Job as well. He knew God. He knew God. But at the end of his book, he said, my, my ears had heard about you. But now, after going through all this experience, my eyes have seen you. So the question I have for you is, who is Jesus to you? Do you really know who Jesus is? You say, yes, I know. I've been going to kids church since I was a child. I've been to church for many years. Yes, but that's not what I'm asking you. Do you have the revelation of who Jesus is? Because whenever we encounter Jesus, it starts with knowing who he is. That's why the Apostle Paul said, who are you, Lord? So that's the first level of illumination. The second type of illumination that happens in our hearts is the illumination of who we are, the illumination of our identity. I am so blessed by the, the testimony of uh, our sister Jo. And when we were discussing, wow, you know, when you, when you speak with Jo, she just puts fire in your heart. I don't know about you. The more time, if you spend more time with Joe, you're going to go out and preach the gospel to all the country because she has that fire. But it is so amazing to see how God is, is changing our identity, reminding us who we are. 
And you know, the, the Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, had no qualification to become uh, one of Jesus' apostles. The guy was a blasphemer. The guy was a persecutor of the church. The guy was even a murderer. So his past was not talking in his favor. And most, some of us, if we look in, in, at our lives, we can say, God, there is no way you can use me. There is no way you can use me. Because I'm a bad person. And Saul was definitely a bad guy. And one day Jesus appealed to a man called Ananias and he said, okay, you have to go and to pray for this guy called Saul of Tarsus. And Ananias said, Jesus, are you serious? This guy? I've heard only bad reports about him. He's, he's putting Christians in jail, he's, he's killing people, and he's killing all your people, and you are sending me to pray for him? And Jesus said, listen, your identity is based on what I say. Right? You look at this guy, you look at his past. Yes, he is a killer, he was a murderer. Yes, he was a blasphemer. But I look in my, in my mirror, and this guy is, is chosen. I chose him. And whenever God looks at you, what he says is that you are loved. You are forgiven. You have a new identity. Yes, sadly people will still call you with old names. They will still call you like the thief. They will still call you, oh, that woman was a, I don't know, was a, an adulterous woman. That guy was an angry guy. Yes, people will still give you those names, but whenever you you have this encounter with Jesus, it illuminates who you are. Your identity is based on who God says that you are. And you are chosen, when, no matter what people say. And God spoke to this guy, this murderer. He said, I choose you. You're going to be my instrument. And we live in a society where our identity is based on, on our clothes. You know, we're based on identity on the brand of our clothes. But this is just a piece of fabric. We base our identity on the brand of the car that we drive. We base our identity on the type of house that we have, on our studies. But really our identity is found on who God says that we are. And that's why the same guy, the Apostle Paul wrote in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. It doesn't matter the, the name that people give you. When, whenever you are in Christ, whenever you have that encounter with Jesus Christ, it completely changes your identity. You don't have to walk uh, with shame anymore. You can stand up and walk with boldness, with assurance, just like our sister shared this morning. You can really look at people and smile and say, yes, I know who I am. Yes, I used to be a blasphemer, but today I am chosen for Jesus. Yes, I used to be a thief, but today I'm chosen for Jesus. Yes, I'm different, I'm a little bit weird, Less, yes, I don't speak English very well, yes, I don't speak Dutch very well, yes, I, I come from a country that is a cool country, but today in Jesus Christ, I'm a new creation. And that is the illumination that happens when we encounter God. He will show you who you are. And the question is, how do you define yourself? How do you define yourself? When people ask you who you are, what do you say? Well, my name is Blaise and I drive a nice BMW. Yeah, but that's, that's not important. That's not what people want to know. Who, do, who are you? Your identity is, is, is found in what Jesus says about you. And like I said, sadly, there will be people who will still continue to call you with those names from the past. But it doesn't matter. You look in God's mirror. You know, there is something that I love to do every morning when I, when I wake up, when I'm preparing to go to work. I look at the mirror, and yes, there are men who also look at the mirror before they go to work. I look at the mirror, I don't put makeup, don't worry. But, and I like to, to talk to myself. And when I speak to myself, I say, you are loved by God. You are loved by God. You are forgiven. You are gifted. You have value. You are chosen. And you are going out there in the world, you, you're going to meet people who are going to be bad, who are going to be uh, mad against you, who are going to be disrespectful, disrespectful sorry, against you. People, people are going to laugh about you, but it doesn't matter. You just go there and shine Jesus' love. Because your identity is based on who Jesus says that you are. So who? Who are you? 
Where do you, where do you find your identity? In your bank account? Now, maybe some of you have a nice bank account. Some millions are waiting over there. Hopefully, you're going to share with us one day. <laughs> but, no, our identity is not based on, on the money that we have. This is not, it's not even based on the type of job that we have. It's, it is based on who Jesus says that you are. And with that, it gives you confidence. You can wake up every morning with joy. And people will ask you, Hey, are you not afraid of the future? I say, no, because I know who I am. The third level of illumination is not only about our identity, but also about our calling. Illumination on our calling and our purpose. We have a calling. We have a purpose. We are not here by mistake. We are not here by chance. There are still people who believe that. Thank God for them. But we are here because we have a purpose. When the Apostle Paul met Jesus, the guy was going to Damascus with another purpose. He had another goal. But when, when he, he encountered Jesus, Jesus said, no, from now I'm going to reveal the, the calling that I have for you. I have chosen you to be my instrument. You're going to go and proclaim my, my name in, uh, in, among your people, among the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles. Because you are my instrument. I have a purpose for you. And, 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 and the calling that God has for us is, is amazing. It, it goes beyond our jobs. It's nice to have a nice job, but our calling is, is way far and beyond that. And we all have a calling. That's why this, the same guy actually wrote in, uh, in one of his books, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He says that we are God's handiwork. We are God's masterpiece. And we have been created to produce good works. And those works were prepared in advance for us to do. Which means that God created you to accomplish some good works. So you are here for a purpose. And the question for us is just to know, God, show me those good works. What am I supposed to do? But you have a purpose. You are not here by mistake. You know, it doesn't matter how you came to this world. You know, my mom always tell, uh, reminds me uh, of how I was born. I come from Congo, I was born in Congo, and I was born actually on a boat. We were traveling from uh, a city called Kisangani to Kinshasa, and I was born there, in the boat. But my mom always tell me, it doesn't matter how you came on earth, because Jesus was born in a manger, right? But he, he was still the Son of God. So it doesn't matter how you came on this planet, you still have a purpose. And the question is, to ask God, God, illuminate me on my purpose. Illuminate me on the calling that you have for me. Because until you, have, you haven't found that calling, there is something that is missing in your life. Until, until the Holy Spirit has revealed the calling that he has for you, you're going to miss something in your life. Yes, you can have a nice job, you can make a lot of money, but if you don't fulfill God's calling upon your life, your life will, will be miserable at some point. Because we have been created for God. We have been created by God. We have been appointed to serve God, and we have a calling. But God's calling doesn't mean that life is, is going to be easy. Life is, is going to be, you know, cool, relaxed. The Apostle Paul, who accepted his calling, was put in prison. The guy was beaten. The guy was almost, I don't know how many times he was, almost killed. But he still embraced the calling. And because of his obedience, you and me are here today. You and me can read his books. You and me can read his writings. And you can see the wisdom, the knowledge that you can get from Christ. Who Christ is and who you are in Christ. Because that guy accepted and he said, I'm going to take your calling. It doesn't matter what, what is waiting for me on the, on the road. I'm going to embrace your calling. And the, the question is, do you realize that you have a calling? Because there are people who are waiting for you outside, for you to embrace the calling that God has for you. It's because of his obedience that we are reading Ephesians, that we are reading Colossians, that we are reading Galatians, that we are reading all these books that he sent to the churches. Because one man who was a murderer understood his identity, he understood his calling, and he said, Jesus, I'm in. I'm in. And hopefully you're going to say the same. So the question to you is, do you know that you have a purpose? What is your purpose in life, if I ask you? 
Is your purpose just to be here and to make sure that you complete the number of inhabitants in the country of Netherlands? <laughs> Hopefully not. Uh, is your purpose just to get married and have a child, have children and have a nice house? I'm married, I have a child, I have a nice uh, spouse, a house, but I can tell you I'm not happy yet. Right? <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the final step of my life. I want to fulfill God's, God's mission for me. I have a calling. And that calling really happens when you have that encounter with Jesus. He will eliminate you to know who He is, to know who you are, and to know what is your calling. What is your calling as a man? What is your calling as a woman? And what is your calling as a student as well? Hopefully, you can follow whatever I'm saying. If I'm, if I'm speaking too fast, you just say, Bless, can you slow down a little bit? Right? Uh, the fourth type of elimination concerns our theology. Elimination on our theology. And this one is really deep to my heart. The Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, was a Pharisee. He grew up as a Pharisee, really uh, in Judaism, in strict Judaism. And um, he was convinced that all the people who followed Jesus were not in the truth. He was convinced that he should oppose the gospel of Jesus. He should make sure that that gospel is not spread out. That was his theology. He was, he was putting Christians in prison because he, he, was, he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And sadly today there are still Christians who, whose gospel is, is, is mixed of it's kind of a toxic combination of everything. We have people who, whose gospel is a mix of, you know, a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of postmodernism, a little bit of Hinduism, and then they add to it a little bit of, I don't know, you know, polytheism. And then, yeah, you just make whatever you want of the gospel. And you know what? It ends up becoming a toxic combination. But that's not the gospel. And whenever you have an encounter with Jesus, he will illuminate you on the theology. He will illuminate you on what gospel really is. Because we live in a society where there are, there are so many types of gospels out there. There are people who are preaching that women should not speak. There are people who are preaching that men only should have beer. There are people who are preaching that women should not wear pants. All these kind of, 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 of theories, of philosophies. And there are people who are believing in that. But when the Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, met Jesus, he changed completely his theology. He knew now that the gospel is about sin. Sin is a reality. I know sin is not a word that is fashion today, but sin is a reality. And we were all separated from God. All of us we were separated from God. And without Jesus, we are condemned. Without Jesus, we are condemned. He is the only way to the Father. And that's part of the gospel. He died for us. That's part of the gospel. He rose again. And resurrection is true. It's part of the gospel. Because the same guy said that without resurrection, you know what? We give up everything. We go home. And we just live our lives. Yes. It's true. And it, it, is, it is nice for us to kind of sometimes sit down and ask us the question, what type of gospel am I believing in? What type of theology am I following? You know, this week I was in a conversation. Uh, there was a young lady who asked a genuine question. She said, is it wrong for Christians to have a tattoo? You know, it was, she was really she just wanting to know. And I could see the answer of people, how she, the people were really kind of aggressive towards her, saying, you, no, you should not have a tattoo because you're going to go to hell if you do that. And I was thinking, oh my God, who came with this kind of theology? Who say that salvation is based on you having a tattoo or not? Salvation is based on you declaring, confessing Jesus with your mouth and believing with your heart. And it is time for us to sometimes tell people, your gospel is not the gospel of Jesus. And I took time, I, I spoke with that girl and said, listen, let no one despise you. Because if you believe in Jesus, if you accept him as your Lord and your Savior, you're going to be saved. And I, I'm going to tell you, there will be people without tattoo in hell. <laughs> oh yes, that's true, because they did not accept Jesus. So it's not about you having tattoo or not. 
So it's time for us to go back to, to the Word. It's time for us to, to, to read the Bible again, to study the Bible again. That's why in this church we love to have Bible studies. We love to have conversations, discussions, to really ask ourselves this, the question, what am I believing in? What is my theology? And the same guy, the Apostle Paul, if you read, I will encourage you to read all his writings, but at so many occasions he's writing to the churches and he said, I'm so astonished that many of you are quitting the gospel. You are, turning, you are turning away from the true gospel and listening to all those false teachers. How come? What happened to you? How come that we, we give up on, 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 on the importance of crucifixion? How come we give up on the importance of resurrection? How come we don't celebrate resurrection anymore? We don't understand the power of resurrection. How come we don't understand that we were separated from God and, and God, Jesus came to save us? That without Jesus, there is no life. How come we just take Jesus as one of those prophets, as one of those other gods? No. There is no one who did what Jesus did. There is no one who can compare to Jesus. No one. And the question I have for you is, what kind of gospel are you listening to? If the gospel that you listen to is bringing more confusion in your life, then maybe it's time to sit down and say, wait a minute, what am I believing in? And Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse, I think it's verse 32, he was speaking to some people who believed in it. He said, if you abide in my word, and my word abides in you, then you're going to know the truth, and that truth will set you free. When you know that truth, it will set you free from all kinds of fake teachings and, and all kinds of fake doctrines and all kinds of fake gospels, because you know the truth. And my hope is really that our encounter with Jesus will give us the need to know more about God, to know more about God's Word. That's why I love to study the Bible. I love to go deeper. I love to, 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 to know how Jesus reacted, how Jesus loved people, to really know what is, what is his message today. Because today we, we hear a type of gospel that is a kind of, uh, it, 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 it turned into just encouragement. You know? It's just encouragement. Just be the best of you, follow your dreams, you know, dream big. Everybody can say that, dream big. That's nice. Dream big, yes, but why don't you dream Jesus' dream? Why don't, you dream? why don't you follow what Jesus is telling you to follow? And for us as a church, Damascus Crow, our desire is to go back to the truth. And, and uh, there is a song that Pastor Mark wrote, it's called The Roadmap. And there is a line there that says that truth brings illumination. Truth brings illumination. When there is no truth, then we live in darkness. But when Jesus brings truth on your identity, truth on your calling, truth on the theology, it brings illumination. Nobody can, can tell you lies when you know the true gospel. And the last thing I want to share is um, the illumination of our hope. The illumination of our hope. Whenever you encounter Jesus, my friend, you will see the hope that you have. We have hope in Jesus. We have hope. I was discussing with uh, a few colleagues, and they were talking about how the, the situation right now is, is really bad. You know, the, the press is going high, and everybody was depressed. And they asked me, so what is your, what is your view on everything that is going on? And all I could say is that, well, I have hope. They say, you have hope? Yes, I have hope. Because my hope is not based on what is happening in the world. My hope is not happening, it is not based on people, I mean, on the, the prices going high or not. My hope is based on Christ Jesus. Remember what we sang today. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And one day the Apostle Paul was arrested and brought in front of the king, King Agrippa. 
And then they say, okay, now you can speak for your defense. And he said, King Africa, the reason why I'm here, the reason why I'm arrested, the reason why I'm persecuted is just because of my hope in God. Wow, the same guy was, was blaspheming Jesus, the same guy was putting uh, Christians in jail. Now he's speaking, saying, I have hope, I have hope. That's why I'm here. And my friend, there is hope in Jesus. Hope not only here on earth, but in, 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 in eternity. There is hope that whenever you are going through tough situations, that you are not alone. Jesus is, is with you. There is hope that whenever you, you lack money, because you are serving him, he's going to provide. There is hope that when everybody is, 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 is stressed, when everybody is, de is depressed, there is hope in him. You don't need to be alone. You don't need to try to do things by your own. There is hope in Jesus. And when you are persecuted, when you are insulted, when people are saying all kinds of things against you, there is hope in Jesus. And when you have an encounter with Jesus, he illuminates you with the hope. And the same guy, Apostle Paul, wrote again in Colossians chapter 1. He says, this language is really popular in Christianity. He says, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of glory. There is hope in your studies. There is hope in your marriage. There is hope in your family. God sees you. When you pray for your brothers and sisters to, to know God, you have been praying for so many years, you have been crying out, there is hope. God sees the time that you invest to speak to other people. There is hope. God sees that, yes, you have lost your job and you have kids and you have bills to pay. Yeah. There is hope. Our hope is not built on our money. Our hope is not built on our finances. You know, one day we will die and all, we will leave all our bank accounts here on, planet, on this earth. But our hope in Jesus will continue into the eternity. There is hope. And when you have that hope, it completely changes who you are, how you, 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 you uh, approach life. You approach life with with joy, you, you approach life with knowing that you have a future. Jo God said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, chapter 29, verse 11, I have a future for you. I have good plans for you. And God has good plans for you. Maybe you have never heard that. I want you to hear that today again. God has plans for you. Yes, His plans sometimes, we don't really understand it. It's full of high lows. There is hope. There is hope. And the question to you is, do you have hope today? You say, yes, I have hope because I know my father is still alive. My father takes care of me. Whenever I'm, I'm in need, I can call my father. He's always there. And you know, that was my life. Me and my father were really close. And I was really counting on my father. And then in 2009, my father died. And I was so mad at God. I said, why did you do that to me? I've been praying to you. I've been so faithful to you. My, my whole family has been faithful to you. My father has been serving you. How can you remove him? How can you take him away? And it took me months to realize that whenever God does, he does it for a purpose. And whenever God removes something from your life, there is still hope. There is still hope. When you keep your eyes on Jesus, there is hope. So the question to you is, do you have hope? And what is the foundation of your hope? Hopefully, like we said today, you're going to say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I want to close with uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20. This is like a prayer that the Apostle Paul is, um, is praying for the church in, Ephes in Ephesians just before he closed this chapter. He said, For this reason, ever, ever since I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. 
I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened or illuminated in order that you may know the hope which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. I pray this morning that God will continue to illuminate you, for you to know who he, who he is really, for you to know who Jesus is. I pray that God will illuminate the, the eyes of your heart, for you to know who you are in Jesus, and to define yourself according to what Jesus is saying about you not what people are saying. I pray that God will illuminate you for you to know what is your calling, for you to know what is the true theology, and for you to know that you have hope. I want us to pray uh, right now, maybe if you can come and play some music. And, and I'm going to make this, I don't know if you can call it an auto call or call, whatever you want to call it. If you are here and you say, I really want to have experienced illumination in one of the, those areas that you spoke about. I want to be illuminated on who Jesus is. I want to know more about Jesus. Or you say, I want to be illuminated on my identity. I feel like I don't know who I am. Or you say, I feel like I, I don't really know what is my purpose. I don't really know what is my calling. Or you say, I, I, I don't know what I believe in. I don't know what is the theology I believe in. I feel like I'm in this confusion of all kinds of philosophies. I, I want to know what is, what is the true gospel. Or you say, I'm here and I, I miss hope. I need hope. So if you are here, if there is at least one of those areas or maybe more than that, I'll just ask you as we close our eyes to pray. Uh, I'm just ask you if you want to to just stand at your place where you are. You can just remain standing. And if you don't want to stand, you can just raise your hands. It's, it's also fine. But yeah, just as an act of faith, just standing and say, God, I need illumination in one of the, those areas. And we're going to pray. <coughs> God, I thank you that you love us so much that you gave your only son to encounter us, to meet with us. I thank you that you want to bring light into our lives. You want to bring light in so many areas of our lives. And uh, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are standing here right now by faith. I pray for those who are asking you to reveal yourself to them so that they can know you more so that they can know who you are. I pray that you will continue to reveal yourself to them during this, this week and also in the coming weeks as they study the word, as they pray. I pray that you will reveal yourself to them, Lord, for them to know who you are really. I pray for those who are struggling to know what is their identity, to know who they really are today. I pray for those who, are, who have been maybe identifying that themselves with the materialistic, materialistic things of this earth. I pray that you will show them who they are in you, Jesus. Because in Christ Jesus, they are new creation. I pray that uh, you will help them also find their purpose, find the calling that you have for them. And for all those who are praying and asking, God, show me what is your purpose for me. Show me what are your plans for me. Show me what are those good works that I'm supposed to produce. God, I pray that you will make this clear for them. And I want to pray for all those who have been struggling with, um, with the gospel, struggling with their theology. They don't know exactly what they believe in anymore. They don't know exactly what is, what is the truth. I pray that you will guide them as they study the Bible, as they meet in the Bible study groups, and as they pray, I pray that you will really reveal the truth in them so that that truth will set them free. And I pray for all those who have been struggling to, to, to see the hope that we have. Lord, for those who have been crying out and say, God, where can I find, find the answer? I pray that they will see that there is hope in Jesus here on earth, but also in eternity. I pray for all of us.
that you will continue to eliminate the eyes of our heart. You will continue to eliminate the eyes of our heart for us to know what is your purpose for all of us, Lord. Continue to bless all of us, Lord, as a church. And uh, yeah, I'm so looking forward to hear the testimonies and the, the, the God stories of what you are doing in our lives. We thank you, Jesus, and we love you because you loved us first. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Last song to close. This is also another song to clap with. Uh, so it'd be great if you can clap along with us.
of our Lord Jesus. And may we go especially with the illumination that the Holy Spirit brings. And may God continue to illuminate all of us as we go. As we speak with our friends, our colleagues, may God continue to illuminate all the areas of our lives. So may God bless you and uh, have a good Sunday.